Good morning. Now we're going to continue our discussion of uh, yesterday, which was the hierarchical structure of objectivism. I outlined for you the main subdivisions within the basic branches of metaphysics and epistemology. And I said that today we are going to take one of those units, the one that I titled reality, which is metaphysics, and apply the method of hierarchical structure to it. That within each of the main units, all the topics themselves are related structurally, hierarchically. One necessarily precedes the other, and so on. And therefore, the best way, I think, to concretize this, short of having, you know, 40 lectures where we go over every structural step, is to take one, a reasonably simple one, which is metaphysics, which is much easier than epistemology. So we're going to basically discuss only reality, uh, this morning, which is not as much as it seems, because philosophers only talk in very broad terms. They know, you know about reality in general, but nothing in particular. Now, obviously, we start with axioms. In fact, to be exact, we start with basic axioms, and I'll indicate to you in a moment why you have to put the word basic before the word <coughs> axioms. Axioms are the starting point. You all by now must know what are the big three uh, basic axioms of objectivism. So as a quick reminder for the hundred odd people who are new here, what, um, somebody remind me, what are the three basic axioms of the objectivist philosophy? Yes. Existence, identity, and consciousness. I'm not putting these on the board yet, because I'm only going to put them on the board when we get the right order. Because we're concerned here, as we're taking for granted, you know the content, we're concerned with the order. By existence, we mean the fact that there is something. What is, is. There is a something out there. By identity, that which is, is what it is. It's something, it has a nature, it has an identity, and symbolically, A is A. And by consciousness, we have the faculty of being aware of, or perceiving, or grasping that which is, and that faculty being consciousness. Those, of course, you know, are the elementary starting points. There's, there is something that we're aware of. As adults, those are clearly the presupposition of any conclusion, any thought process, any mental cognitive activity of any kind. There has to be something that you're aware of, and it has to be what it is. But now we are talking about the order of coming to learn, not the order of adult interdependence, where everything requires these, but the order of actually acquiring them. If you had to pick among these three, which was the first, because they are learned in a chronological order, and in fact a substantial time period between the first, the second, and the third of these. Now, that's pr I, I can't build up too much suspense here <laughs> as to which comes first. Which do you think comes first of these? Existence, yeah, that one I can definitely put down safely as the start. I'm going to have a column of order here from the earliest on through the latest. Why does this have to come first? Because that obviously we can't talk about knowing until you say knowing what. You can't talk about the thing being what it is before you have the being. You can't talk about anything or do anything until you say it is. That is the uh, absolute primer. Now, in Galt's speech, if you remember, uh, his original introduction of axioms is existence exists and that presupposes two corollaries, that something exists which one perceives and that one exists possessing consciousness, consciousness being the faculty of perceiving that which exists. That's from memory after 30 years of quoting it. Uh, <coughs> so he introduces existence and consciousness as the first two. So can we infer from that, therefore, that the second axiom in order of acquisition is 
consciousness. No, you certainly cannot. He's speaking there from an adult uh, perspective. Consciousness is, is much too soon at this stage even to have an implicit grasp of consciousness. Now remember, when you have an implicit grasp of something, you have learned something even though you haven't put it in words. Implicit is not an empty term. You can't say the child at birth implicitly knows the theory of relativity. He just hasn't worded it. When you ascribe even implicit knowledge to a, a, a young child, you are ascribing definite cognition. Implicit means, actually, he has all the data for the concept that he will one day reach. He has not yet, however, been able to perform the adult act of integration, of putting that data together and giving a term to it, and making a new conscious unit out of it. But it, when you have the implicit grasp of a concept, you already know the substance of its units. You just haven't yet been able to put it into words. So at this early stage, you do not even have an implicit grasp of consciousness. To grasp that, you would need some kind of ability to turn in an inner focus or perspective, an ability to say, you know, in, in non-verbally, but an ability equivalent to say, I'm not concerned with what's out there now, but with what is going on in here, with my process of coming to grasp what's out there. And that, of course, is a is a sophisticated development. Uh, you couldn't possibly undertake such a process when all you have is, it is. You, know, you haven't even the beginning yet of a clear, a clear awareness of what it is out there before you could make that abstraction. So the next of the axioms would have to be, this is by a process of elimination, would have to be identity. I am, however, not going to put identity on the board directly under existence for a reason that you will see in a moment. I'm leaving a little space in case something else should come up. But just to uh, elaborate why uh, we put identity after existence, that represents a distinct and later step of cognition. It represents not only the thing is, but, oh, I see the same thing again, something recognizable, something which is what I saw before, and it has recurred. So it's not just it is, but this is as against that other thing. And that's something in particular as against all the other things. And when the child reaches the stage of the capacity to recognize what it saw before, that represents the implicit grasp of identity. And that, of course, is definitely a later step. It's hard to say how much later, but it's certainly weeks and po possibly even months. I think more likely months after the original grasp, whereas existence, you can't get anything more than what you get when you open your eyes. That's it. Till the, till the day you die or the highest scientist will never know more about just it is than the baby knows when he opens his eyes. But when you get to identity, you're already comparatively sophisticated. Now, why did I leave this space? I left it for a very crucial axiomatic concept, which is not, however, one of the basic axioms, but which even precedes identity. And you can guess what that concept is if you remember the introduction to objectivist epistemology. Who wants to uh, fill this in? Ayn well, well, Rand is developing the progression from existence then there's a step, and then there's identity, and then there's unit when she goes off to her concept formation. But what is the step between existence and identity? No, no. Existent is just a way of specifying existence. Entity. The concept of entity has to come here. Now, entity means of course, it's an axiom, so you can't give it a definition, but entity means a thing, a something, a delimited, bounded, perceptual thing, like a table, a chair, a person, a cat, a dog, a car, etc. In contrast to simply a whirl of fleeting sensations. 
The infant for the first month goes through what we call a sensory or sensational stage. And it just has whirling, fleeting bits of data which he doesn't connect. So if a sound emanates from an object, he hears the sound, and then when it stops sounding, the sound passes. Then he looks at it and he gets a blur of color, and when the thing is moved, the color goes. And he just gets these discrete passing sensations. But at a certain point, he reaches the perceptual level. This is in the early months, but it does take a few months. He integrates sensations and he perceives a thing. And that is the first, that is the precondition of going on to grasp entity. He can't grasp this thing versus that thing. He can't grasp recognizable patterns and thus identity until he first stabilizes that flux of sensations in the grasp of a solid thing. So the logical progression has to be, it is. And then he's simply bombarded and at a certain point he grasps a thing as opposed to a flux. And then he grasps mama, which is not yet the concept mother, of course, but the same thing over and over, and he gets this thing versus that thing. So the, really the progression is existence, entity, identity. Now, you may be curious if entity is so fundamental that the concept even uh, precedes and as a precondition of grasping identity, why don't we, um, for the same price, since there's no law about restricting the number of axioms, toss it in and say that there are four basic axioms rather than three. See, entity is an axiom, but it's not a basic axiom. Can you, uh, do you have any idea as to why entity is not placed in the status of fundamental philosophic axiom, even though it has this absolutely indispensable place in our cognitive development? Now, I don't want tremendously wild theories, but I'd be curious to know. <laughs> I think you've already made a volunteer. We're trying to cut down to one per person. Yes? Yes, absolutely true. Entity is a concretizing of existence. It is a narrower term by far than existence or identity. The three axioms that we recognize as the fundamental axioms apply to absolutely everything, whether you're talking about entity, actions, qualities, quantities, relationships. Whatever form of existence you're talking about, it is, it is what it is, and you grasp it only by being aware of it. But entity is already a definite specification. You're saying this is existence in its very specific form. Beyond that, uh, so it's not as universal uh, as the other three. Uh, beyond that fact, we want to leave open, you must remember that a philosopher is not an armchair physicist. And we, we, we can make absolute statements in philosophy only because we are not infringing on the possible subsequent discoveries of physics. And we want to leave open what will physics ultimately discover about the essential nature of existence or reality. Now, if you've taken my earlier uh, courses, <coughs> you know that I put forth the construct that there's no basis for that we would discover one day at omniscience that <coughs> atoms and so on are themselves made of some kind of ethereal energy puffs, which are nothing like tables, chairs, and so on as we perceive them, and that all the entities we perceive are the ways that those puffs act on our senses. Now, as I say, there's no basis whatever to believe this, but I'm just leaving open who knows what they're going to discover? Of course, today you can't count what they discover because they use improper methods. But even in, in a rational period, they might discover astounding things about the ultimate constituents of reality. And they may discover that what we call entities are forms of perceiving whatever it is that's out there. Which, of course, I hasten to add, in no way makes entities subjective or our senses invalid or reality unknowable. But that's a separate question, I trust. But now you are aware of that. But that's the other factor of why we want as basic philosophic axioms those which are absolutely inconceivable 
to be non-applicable no matter what finally comes up. And whatever the puffs or the smears or the super energy that you imagine, it has to be what it is and we discovered it. So those three you can't uh, uh, escape. So with this, however, is in no way to degrade entity, uh, make it non-metaphysical, make it suspect. I, I assume I don't have to keep fighting off uh, skepticism uh, here. <clears throat> All right. Uh, by the way, just so you want to anticipate this question, I have not worked out, and nor did Ayn Rand, a chart of all other possible axiomatic concepts which would be like entity in that they are inescapable to develop our consciousness, but they're not themselves basic philosophic axioms. There's definitely got to be others, for instance, the concept of action, which would have to be a primary. You could only get that by direct observation, and you couldn't go anywhere until you were able to grasp actions. But uh, this takes us into uh, really undeveloped waters, uh, so I don't have an answer at this point, perhaps someday, to how many others, but this will get us going. I mean, we lived our life so far with this much, so this will get us going for today. Now, do you b think that consciousness would come now? since it's a fundamental axiom. And we're speaking on the implicit level. I myself don't. I don't think you can yet even grasp consciousness. So I'm going to put consciousness down, but I'm going to leave a space in case, obviously, we have to grasp this by, we have to grasp consciousness by an act of looking in. And as I tried to suggest yesterday, you'd have to have more of a grasp of what's outside before you would reach the degree of sophistication of being able to distinguish your means of awareness from what you're aware of. Even in that implicit childlike stage, I, I think consciousness, the first sign of a child grasping consciousness is when it has the experience that it closes its eyes and things go away and it opens them, and they come back. Now, of course, that happens all the time, but the first time the child attends to that and realizes that something that he does with his eyes makes reality come and go is the beginning of the grasp of such a faculty as awareness. And if you know uh, children, you know that that takes place substantially later. We're talking months after uh, other things happen. So I think there has to be a, a firmer and fuller grasp of reality before we can have this grasp of consciousness. What then comes next in terms of key principles? Well, if you know the objective is viewed, there's something that's crying out here to fill exactly this slot because it would consist of giving that full grasp of reality which is uh, required, and it consists of nothing but putting together what we have uh, already grasped, and therefore there is something that is just begging to be put in this one slot, something that amounts to the idea entities act in accordance with their identities. <laughs> now what is that? Causality, cause and effect. So I would definitely put that there. It follows very rapidly from entity and identity, because implicit in any later perception, once you've reached that stage, is certain entities act a certain way. We would put that in adult terms, is it acts according to what it is. It's governed by what it is as opposed to by what I, the child, want it uh, to be. If I let the book go, it goes down. And no matter how I cry or whatever, it goes down. On the other hand, if I let the, take the balloon and let it go, it goes up. And of course, at a very early age, you see these recurrent patterns on a purely perceptual level. Uh, before, before you have a conceptual uh, ability, but you do see certain kinds of things characteristically acting uh, certain ways. Now, I do believe 
by the way, if you're interested, that the experience of frustration is central, uh, if you're just interested in the psychological detail, to grasp cause and effect. I don't think you would ever grasp, a child would ever grasp cause and effect if somehow, by means of omnipotent parents, every whim or desire of his was immediately transformed into reality. He would never grasp the idea of a stable outside world. It would be a, like a magic or fantasy or dream world. What makes it reality is that certain things happen inexorably, whether you like it or not. This sort of thing is going to do this, and nothing in the world can stop it. And then as soon as a child grasps that, and if he, if he has decent parents, he grasps it maybe a little earlier than others, but no one can conceal it from their children 100%. Uh, <clears throat> he is grasping, he then has truly, implicitly, only implicitly, but nevertheless, actually, he has the knowledge a thing acts according to its nature. That's what it amounts to. He's grasped thing, he's grasped nature, identity, that it is a certain kind of thing, and then he sees that it acts a, a particular way accordingly, and that that is invariable, that's outside of anybody's uh, control. So it's in this sense that he grasps what uh, Ayn Rand identifies in adult terms that causality is a corollary of uh, identity. And therefore, the, really, the, the validation of causality is, comes down to the perceptual level. If you know David Hume, you know that there, therefore this is the exact opposite, because he says he looked and he looked and he couldn't find causality. And the answer is he obviously didn't look in the right place, because it's everywhere. <laughs> causality is nothing more nor less than an entity acting a certain way. And in the, once you grasp that an entity is something and you observe its action, that is it. There is no more to the grasping of causality uh, except than the adult formulation. Now, with regard to the concept of action, just parenthetically, because that an entity acts a certain way is central to causality, I am not entirely sure where the concept of action comes in. I think you could make a case that in the process of grasping entity to begin with, you grasp action implicitly, because the way you grasp entities is by observing their action. If an entity was completely motionless, it would not strike the child's attention the way it would if you move something back and forth. So I think there's a, you could make a case that entity and action are indissolubly wedded and that the child grasps them both. On the other hand, I'm not exactly happy about putting action prior to identity, so there may be, there's some argument that you can put back and forth, but right around that time you have to grasp action either right before or right after identity, so I'm not putting it on the chart, but it obviously is a requirement to grasp causality. Causality is a certain kind of action, so you have to grasp action at some early stage. But as I say, I'm not yet omniscient, and I haven't worked out uh, every detail. Now it's at this point, I think, that the child can grasp consciousness. It's, he's now got the idea of an orderly world of entities behaving a certain way according to their nature. He has that implicitly. And that, and of course he has it, not in the form of broad abstractions, but in the form of all kinds of concrete examples. At that point, I believe, he now has enough, and is laid into the first year, to focus inward in that implicit way and grasp his faculty of awareness. So that's where I would put the development of the first grasp of the axiom of consciousness. Now you see it's a paradox to say this is an axiom. Absolutely all cognition is dependent upon it. You have to know it to know anything. And on the other hand, you don't learn it for many months and you learn all kinds of other things first. And that is the kind of thing that deeply bothers people for understandable reasons if they don't grasp the distinction between the process of acquiring the knowledge, and then the absolute logical interdependence of it all once you finish spiraling back and forth. All right, um, where do we go after consciousness? Well, I think the next step 
is now obvious. It's all of these basically flow out of the other. They're ways, they're new corollaries or aspects, new angles or perspectives on the original. It is. You see, it's an it. It's a something. Therefore, it does something. Oh, I grasp this. Now, where would you go developing the concept of you, you're grasping it, that developing, well, I don't know how to hint it without uh, giving it away. Who would go where next, talking about a major metaphysical issue that we're now uh, at the stage where you can grasp? You grasp that you're aware, but at this point, inherent in grasping that you're aware is the implicit knowledge that there's nothing whatever you can do with your awareness but what? Look out and grasp what's there. In other words, no, 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 no. We're not anywhere near the senses yet. We're not, we're not discussing the means of knowledge. We still are focusing on reality. The primacy of existence is what I'm looking for. Now that, that is a later development. The primacy of existence. See, obviously, you couldn't grasp the primacy of existence until you grasp consciousness. Primacy of existence, now, here again, we have this problem of we have to explain what we're talking about before we explain the question we're really interested in. What is meant by the primacy of existence? The, what is, just what does that theory mean, which is essential to the objectivist uh, metaphysics? Yes? Say again? That it does, that existence is independent of consciousness. That facts are independent of our awareness. That existence is what it is apart from us and that we have only got one thing we can do with consciousness and that is to grasp, look out, discover existence. Now what would the alternative to that view be? That the, the essential negative that objectivism rejects on this question. The primacy of consciousness, and that's the idea that consciousness is not merely the faculty for grasping, but the faculty for changing or altering or creating reality. That consciousness is some kind of, quote, productive entity, that it precedes reality, and that reality is whatever, con whatever the mind wants it to be. And of course, you, as you know from, as most of you know from uh, preceding material. This theory of the primacy of consciousness is held in many forms. Religion is one form. God is a giant consciousness who is supposed to have created reality. Fifty million Frenchmen can't be wrong is one form. Their weight of their collective consciousness is supposed to make them infallible. Reality has to adapt and so on. There's many different forms of it. But what we're interested in is the, is the genesis now of the primacy of a, uh, existence. And I would say this idea that reality is independent of my consciousness has to follow, not precede the causality. Now, this is a change from my original lectures. My original lectures I presented in 1976, the primacy of existence as a corollary of identity. And then we had a, uh, I believe, an intermission and I came back and I said, now, you know, just to mop up and finish off with reality, if you like to get reality out of the way early, um, let's t do some more details, and then we went into uh, cause and effect. Now, I think that is a definite uh, error. The way, in fact, you would grasp that reality is independent of your consciousness is that it is going to do what it's going to do regardless of what you want. You cannot grasp that it's independent apart from it acting uh, a certain way. On the other hand, once you have established a causal world where this thing is going to fall when you drop it, or it's going to make a noise when you bang it, etc., no matter what your screams, tears, and pleas, you then have the living experience of an independent reality of a reality that is what it is and does what it does, no matter what you want. 
And then when you grasp consciousness, implicit in grasping consciousness right away is, well obviously all I can do with my consciousness is look out and grasp because it is already all set and it follows certain definite uh, uh, rules of its own. Whereas at this stage the primacy of consciousness would be an obvious distortion, it would be an obvious blatant falsehood. No child could conceivably, even with brainwashing at this stage of the game, and even if you could communicate it to him, believe the omnipotence of his whim or his wish, etc., because he would see the fact of cause and effect, that things act a certain way and that he just cannot alter it. So I, uh, I, I'm amending, therefore, the structural view. I think it's definitely true that the issue of the primacy of existence is a later, let's say, a later generalization from a more sophisticated perspective on the primary fact that entities have to act in certain patterns, which itself is a development of identity, etc. That, to me at least, makes the whole thing very much clearer uh, than the earlier way in where the primacy of existence was put in as a kind of a philosophic discussion uh, because I was very anxious to get it in fast, you know. When, when you lecture, you, you have this feeling you've got to get the important things in right away, but it blurs what is otherwise uh, a, an inevitable logical progression. Now, where we go next with this depends how detailed you want, and I won't try to elicit this from you, but what I would put in here at least the rudiments, I think, that comes next is the issue of the integration of mind and body. In some terms, that's the first point at which I would bring this in. In other words, the idea that there's no war between consciousness and existence. Now, in a healthy child, this issue would not come up in this form. That is, it isn't that he reaches one or one and a half and he says, one day, you know, I realize there's no war between mind and body. It just, it wouldn't come up because nobody would think that there was a war. But I'm now saying, logically speaking, if we take the issue of mind and body that has been so distorted through the ages, you know, that they're a war with each other and you have to choose the spiritual versus the material and so on, and ask, what is the root of the answer to that and where does it come? It comes at this point because at this point you grasp Really, the primacy of existence, another way of reformulating that is the harmony of consciousness and existence. There can be no clash between the two because consciousness is nothing but the faculty of grasping existence. So there can't be any war. Therefore, there must be a basic harmony. And then, of course, you go on from there. Whereas, if you take the primacy of consciousness, you're doomed to perpetual clash because you're saying, my mind has the power by sheer wish to change reality, and then you find you can't do it. It won't obey. And so there's a constant war between your desire and the facts, between the spiritual inner world and the cruel outer world that doesn't obey, and then, of course, you're all set for the mind-body dichotomy. So let's put this in parentheses, meaning not that the child actually even implicitly thinks in such terms, but that the issue of mind-body really comes back to being a corollary or another perspective on the primacy of existence. Now, we're going to run out of blackboard space, unfortunately. Where would you go in terms of grasping? Now, we're still developing reality. This is all still metaphysics. We're ready now to cash in on uh, all of this foundation and come up with a very uh, crucial, in effect, it's like a metaphysical conclusion. It's the finale of this whole development in, in terms of the relation of reality uh, to man. I, I don't know how to uh, get you to guess this, but it's a word that starts with an A. An A, B. No, abstraction is epistemology. Maybe I should. Absolutes is what I'm looking for. Let's start a new column over here. 
absolutism would be the next development. The ability to grasp that facts are absolutes would, would only at this point uh, be possible. Now I'll give you my formal definition of absolute. Necessitated by the nature of existence and therefore unchangeable. Necessitated by the nature of existence and therefore unchangeable. Actually, in the book, I make it unchangeable by human or any other agency, but we don't have to put all that in. Now, you see, this is the first point at which you could grasp what it means to say something is an absolute. Because now you grasp there is a reality, it operates a certain way, it's independent of you, there's nothing that you can do about those facts, it's inherent in the entities and the way they behave. And therefore, you can now grasp that there are certain things entirely outside of your power to alter. Anybody's power to alter, yours, your parents, the government, they simply, we need a, this crucial concept to say this thing cannot be touched. You can't get away from it, you simply have to accept it. And that is the concept of uh, an absolute, which takes this whole development before you can grasp. And you know already, when people tell you there are no absolutes, they have in some very severe way sabotaged the very foundations of their developing consciousness. It means that they have, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's, they obvious, just to finish that sentence, they obviously have a defective concept of reality or existence. So we'll leave that uh, for a moment. Now, I think either at the same time as you grasp absolutes or very rapidly thereafter, I can't give you, you know, the moment by moment, but one thought has to strike you almost immediately once you grasp the idea of absolute. Of course, the child doesn't need the word absolute. He needs the idea that we could put it in colloquial terms as you can beat your head against a wall and it won't change anything. That's the, really the idea of an absolute, that you cannot get around this thing. But as, as soon as he grasps that there are some things like that, perhaps at the same time or immediately after, he grasps a contrast, namely what? That there are some things you can get around, there are some things you can alter. Some things are not absolutes, but are up to you. For instance, do I wear a tie today or not? That's not an absolute. If I let the tie go, it's got to fall. That's an absolute. But I don't have to pick it up. That is up to me. Now, what is the um, terminology by which we identify this basic distinction between that which is inherent in reality and therefore unalterable as against that which is a product of human beings, or instead of saying a product of human beings, we could say something made by man. And instead of saying it in three words, we could just put a hyphen and call it the man-made. Right. So we now reach the stage of the metaphysical versus the man-made. And of course, when we grasp the man-made, that implicitly it contains what concept? The man-made, that which I can pick and choose. It's up to the way I want it to be. I can have it this way or this way. I don't have to adapt to the way things are. There are things which I can choose or will, and if you want to use it in Latin, you would then say volition. Now, that would be around the age of two. And basically, at that point, you are completed with your metaphysics according to objectivism. So this is like the last grasp of the progression of grasping reality. And that, in itself, as soon as you grasp it, is then the anteroom to epistemology. Because this now, as soon as you grasp that you have choice, the next step is, well, but 
then I have to have some guidance as to how to exercise my choice. What, what am I going to do? And that takes you directly into the normative branches of philosophy, which is epistemology, how should I learn, and ethics, how should I behave, which both develop simultaneously. But this, this represents the end of the, of, of, uh, the primary uh, development, which as I say I think is completed around uh, the age of two. You have a question so far? Yes. Well, self is really your consciousness. It's your consciousness, depending upon how you use the term self, it's, it's you as against other people and the external world. So it's got to, you've got to grasp for self your consciousness, that's the primary, and then you have to grasp that other people also have consciousness, and you grasp yours versus theirs. But that is a later development that would take you then into the formation of your, of your character, and that would be very crucial to develop into ethics. But we're talking here on the most abstract level of the kind of fundamentals required. You couldn't grasp self until well after volition. You first have to grasp you can do certain things, and then you grasp my choices, my preferences, what I like versus what they do. But this is, this is already a more advanced, uh, well, remember, the term self can be used in many senses. In the most abstract sense, you grasp it as soon as you grasp, quote, I am aware of something. You can't be aware, quote, impersonally. So the most fundamental sense of self is the sense of grasping your awareness. Uh, you have the root there, and then it's a matter of differentiating and giving it content. Sometimes we define self as my consciousness and my basic values. That's, that's me, you see, uh, versus you and your values. Well, that would then be a, a later uh, development. Now, you want to ask me questions? I've not finished my presentation yet. Yes? Well, yes, I, I want to, to try to separate out here philosophy from the incipient scientific knowledge that the child develops. The concept of the physical, or of matter, as such, is a very tricky concept to trace the genesis of. It is not the same as, as any of these concepts that we have put on the board. It is not the same. Matter is a sophisticated scientific development. And for instance, they had no clear concept of matter in ancient Greece at all, and it's doubtful whether physicists have a clear concept of it today. Um, but they have something, of course, but matter is a scientific concept. Matter are what we call the physical. It is not the same as existence. There are, uh, you can know absolutely clearly there's something out there. It's things by which you point to you know, entities. They are what they are. They act a certain way and not yet have the idea of the physical or the material. That is already a specification of existence from a scientific point of view. So the child obviously perceives physical things, but the cons and he part, you're entirely right, part of grasping himself is he's got to grasp his body. He would obviously have to perceive his body long before he could introspect. I mean, I couldn't imagine a scenario in which a child was so absent-minded that he spent, you know, nine months looking around outside uh, at, you know, at his crib and his ball and so on, then introspected, and then next week said, oh, gee, I've got arms and legs, too. <laughs> Obviously, one of the earliest things he grasps is his own ar arm movements in his own body, and that he has to grasp very early what Descartes never could, could come to, that, that, that his consciousness and his body together form him. Uh, all of that he has to grasp, but uh, I'm not here trying to give every item of even of important information that a child has to come to, because then I would have to make this like the genetic psychology of the first two years, of which I'm ignorant. I'm just saying these are the fundamental philosophic ideas he must develop, and then depending upon what particular subject we're interested in, you'd have to say what concretes he puts uh, under them. What I wanted to do, though, is to tell you where 
I would conclude a presentation now. Now you see, this is at the same time. This is the order of learning, and it's the proper logical structure of objectivism. If you wanted to establish any point, you have to relate it to the previous and all the way back. This is, and I'll, I'll illustrate that to you in a moment. But this is, therefore, twofold. It's the logical structure, but it's the logical structure because that's the structure that you had to learn it in, and each step presupposed the preceding. But if I were giving a formal presentation, having done all this, only at this point would I go into any uh, polemics. See, this is all positive. Well, of course, I'd have to mention the primacy of consciousness when I got to the primacy of existence, just to dissociate from it. But I would be basically concerned, excuse me, just to elaborate the positive. Only after that would I get to polemics. And by polemics, we mean what? We mean attacking falsehoods. And of course, the two main falsehoods in metaphysics, in metaphysics, that it would be helpful as adults to blow up once you've laid this foundation are what? There's only two. Two widespread, gross, pervasive, glaring, total errors which would wipe out the whole proper foundation and which are the two dominant competing popular metaphysics in the world today. Now what are they? No, primacy of consciousness is too fancy a term here. I wanted the way people actually talk about it. The kind of person that talks about primacy of consciousness is already in trouble because he's named it so clearly that it's hard for him to defend it. That is not the way people characteristically refer to it. Mysticism is a theory of epistemology, not of metaphysics. Mysticism is how you acquire knowledge. It's, it's a theory of what you do to acquire knowledge. Now, we're in metaphysics, the study of reality, and there are only two fundamental ways you can go utterly wrong on the terms that would take in vast uh, uh, amounts of people. Yes? <laughs> Well, but I, obviously, any direct attack on any one of these would wipe out the structure. But I'm looking for something popular that every person has heard of and that wages a, a battle as though these are the only two choices. And in fact, one of them has many distinctive types of buildings erected. No, I don't know any, bu I don't know any building for relativism. Religion is obviously one, yes. Religion is one. Any idea of the supernatural, in other words, any idea of the supernatural is one. That is the popular form in which this whole thing is attacked. And what is the other, the so-called scientific alternative, the guy who scoffs and says religion is, is nonsense? What? No, that skepticism is a term out of epistemology. Skepticism says knowledge is impossible. You have to keep your subject straight. We're in metaphysics. What is the type of person who says this is ridiculous? There is obviously no God. The idea of a soul is a myth. Materialism. Materialism, right. Those are the two dominant metaphysics in the world uh, today. Materialism posing as being scientific and saying nothing exists. But matter, in other words, from this point of view, materialism consists of an outright attack on what? On consciousness, and therefore wipes out the entire structure. But materialism is just an aberration of people who want to pretend to be scientific while being mystical. So it's got, it only has a small coterie, relatively speaking, of followers. But the big, the big evil in uh, metaphysics is religion. Religion is an all-out attack on everything, on absolutely everything step by step. And if you grasp this structure, uh, you will be able to see what is the problem with religion. Which one of these does religion attack, of this whole structure, starting with existence and going down to volition? The totality. It begins by asking, I'm taking the communist religious approach, 
Where did existence come from? Which right away means it denies entirely the, the fact that existence is the starting point. The whole essence of it is to demand that something start before existence and, quote, explain uh, existence. What about, I'm just taking it random, what about causality? The whole idea of God is omnipotent. I can do whatever I want. I, God, can make anything happen. Well, doesn't identity stand in his way? Absolutely not. He created everything. He can make anything into anything, however uh, he wants. What about consciousness? God is supposed to be a cosmic consciousness detached from existence, who nevertheless knows everything. So obviously it's a consciousness that, that has some form of awareness that has no relation to existence and therefore has nothing whatever to do with consciousness as we grasp the faculty of being aware. What about the primacy of existence? Well obviously God is supposed to be the consciousness who is prior to existence. What about absolutes? There are no absolutes except whatever God wills so long as he wills it. What about volition? God preordains everything and we are just helpless puppets of his fatalistic decrees, etc. If you studied religion systematically, you would see that it is like a transcript of the complete negation of existence of the proper view of reality down the board. It's like you take the rudiments that a developing child, the lifelines that it has to grasp in order to reach, you know, the stage of being a confident two-year-old in a com comprehensible realm and world and then able to go on and develop, if you tried to invent something that would wipe out every fundamental of that consciousness, you couldn't find anything other than religion because there would be nothing if you invented it that attacked everything as consistently and systematically as that. So if, if you feel in a polemical mood, this is the point uh, now where I would introduce for the first time uh, the discussion of um, religion. And you will find that any, negatively or positively, any error to show that it's wrong, you have to find its place in that chain or else, any metaphysical error that is, or else the fact that it's the whole chain. And similarly, positively, to prove any one of these points. Now this is where we're cashing in on our whole development, but to prove any one of these points, you have to go back uh, down uh, this chain. For instance, if someone says to you at a cocktail party, well, how do you know there are absolutes? Now what would you, I mean at a cocktail party, you, you just could say, I know, and that's all. But, I mean, <clears throat> so let's uh, strike that. But just suppose you want to know, in your own mind, how do you know there are absolutes? Well, there are absolutes because there are things that I simply can't change because reality is independent of man. Therefore, certain things are just absolutely unavoidable. Well, how do you know it's independent of us? Because it has to follow certain laws. And those laws, well, why, how do you know you can count on those laws? Because they're simply an expression of the fact that a thing is what it is, that it has a certain nature. Well, why does it have a certain nature? Because it is, you see. And you have to do that wherever you start, you have to be able to say why, 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 until finally you get to it is. And that's the final answer. As soon as they say, but why, you say, that is exactly the question. That is exactly where you have to start. So you take everything back to that point, and that's it. And if somebody then says, I don't want to start there, then you just have to leave him to Jesus as the expression uh, <coughs> is. Uh, now, the way, you see the, the, the point here. If you don't have a chain like this, if you have only got the adult knowledge, you know you take lectures and read books and you, you pick up in different ways. Yes, there's absolutes and yes, existence is 
uh, prime is in yes, uh, A is A, and so on, and it's all just interconnected in your mind. Well, that interconnection is true. Every, everything there is completely uh, interconnected. For instance, if there were no volition, now listen, if there were no volition, we could not even establish uh, the primacy of existence. Why? Because you know that volition, speaking now as adults philosophically, is a precondition of the validation of any conceptual knowledge, including all this conceptual knowledge. So obviously everything depends on volition. Or put another, another example. If there were no absolutes, we couldn't rely on the law of identity. So if you look at it from that point of view, absolutism has to precede the law of identity. In other words, as adults, I think you can, you can see this, or if, if, if mind-body were at war with each other, then you could never act on any of your conclusions. So you first would, you'd say, well, I have, to, I have to start there. As adults, they're all absolutely interconnected and interdependent. But as long as you hold it in that interconnected and interdependent way without a structure, you're lost to know what depends on what, or therefore how to prove any given one. If you want to validate, you have to have all of your knowledge in every field of philosophy in the form of a chain like this with the essential links in sequence. And you simply have to practice going back and forth on that chain. And proof consists of taking any one point and showing the links that go back to uh, the beginning. That's all that proof consists of, is, cha is tracing the chain back. We're going to be discussing proof further when we discuss what's distinctive about Ayn Rand's view of logic. But I'm trying to give you the idea that what, if what we want to achieve is this feeling, what we call the perceptual feeling, that when you hear any abstruse idea, how to get the sense of conviction about it, rather than just that some theory that sounded good once and you can't remember why, what you have to do is get at home with traveling the links all the way back, first because you have to know the chain. You have to know the right order. The wrong order is disastrous. Is if we stuck uh, volition in here, for instance, we would blow up the whole chain. You have to know the right order, but then you just have to get it, uh, trace the, the chain back. And if you do that, after a while, you should be able to get it such that it should actually be an experience in your mind. If someone says there are no absolutes, you would hear that exactly as though he said, that blackboard doesn't exist. Because there are no, I mean, while you're looking at it, uh, there are no absolutes actually means there's no independent reality. In other words, there is no entities acting in a certain way. In other words, there's nothing. And if, you, if those connections are clear to you, you would just look at the guy, uh, you know, and say, you would either you could give him a polite answer, but in your own mind, it would immediately erase itself because it'd say, this, this is a, who can deal with someone who says there is nothing and there is no reality? On the other hand, if you don't have this chain and you just think, oh yeah, absolute, that's a good thing. Um, absolute means, and you're trying to remember a definition, what was an absolute? And then uh, he gets you involved in, well, not everything is an absolute because you don't have to wear a tie, and then you're completely lost, you see. <laughs> now, my, my, best, uh, my best suggestion to you for getting out of that state is to go through the hierarchical structure of every branch of knowledge that you are interested in. And that concludes what I had to say about um, structure here. Uh, of course, what you could do, you could take every one of those units, and that's what I do in the book, and break them up exactly that same way. Um, but you can read the book for that if you're interested. But this gives you simply, a, on the simplest case, which is reality, uh, an example of what you have to apply to all cognition in order to make it easily accessible and usable and convincing to you. Previously, there has been a distinction argued for between chronological and logical hierarchy. 
Yet after yesterday's lecture, the implication seems to be that there is no distinction. Um, does the issue of implicit versus explicit knowledge have anything to do with the distinction? In other words, within the context of implicit knowledge, there seems to be no distinction, but within the context of explicit knowledge, there is, is there not a distinction? Well, this is a good and uh, technical but good question. It's what's called, how do you relate chronological and logical order, or chronological and logical structure? Chronology pertains to order in time. For instance, I walk one step, and then the second, and then the third, and then the fourth. Each one is later than the other. But there obviously is not a logical necessity that I had to continue in this direction. I could have gone one step in this direction, and one in this direction. So you could say this sequence of walking, each element was chronologically, but it wasn't necessarily or logically uh, later. Now how do we relate that distinction to what we uh, have on the board here in terms of this series? Logical hierarchy is a subdivision within chronological hierarchy. In other words, the two coincide. Each one that's logically dependent on an earlier is also chronologically later. But the reason chronological is wider is that you have options in learning. Not every learning sequence follows an inexorable order. There are options. A child has to grasp entity, but he could grasp table, and then chair, and then man, and then dog, or dog, and then flower, and then rose, and then orange, etc. There are many options where he has a chronological order which has no logical necessity to it. So you can put it this way, logical hierarchy is chronological hierarchy so far as it is unavoidable. That's the best way I can relate it for you. Logical hierarchy is chronological order so far as it is unavoidable. In other words, if a certain progression must take place in a certain order, then it's not simply that one came after the other, but the first was required to get to the next. That's what makes it a logical progression. But it is true that all logical progressions are chronological uh, as well. Uh, you, you couldn't say, I, I, learned, I learned this one first, but it's logically last. If you had to learn it to go on to something, it's logically uh, prior as well. Now, this issue of the explicit and the implicit, the questioner is correct. We are talking on the implicit level here. Once you have reached the stage of being a philosopher, and we are talking about the order of discovering any one of these points in explicit terms. There is absolutely no philosophic rule as to which one you have to think up first. As a matter of fact, the Greeks never really got a clear concept of consciousness at all. That was a, that was a later uh, discovery, even though implicitly, of course, they had it and were relying on it, but as an explicit concept, uh, they never had it. So, uh, there are many, many, many options as to who would think of what, when. That becomes an accident of a culture, a genius, being born at a certain time, and so on. So if that's what the question here means by there's an option within the explicit element, that's true. But to finish the thing, there is no option about the proper explicit order once the links have been discovered. There may be an option and we can't say who is going to discover explicitly what, when, but once the key elements have been discovered, then the proper adult order is the same as the original proper order of acquisition, because that is the logical structure. I hope that makes it clearer rather than more confusing. Okay, now I'll take uh, general questions. I mean, yeah. Trying to get people near the back. You have to wave if you're near the back because I don't, don't see you. Okay, yes. Now, try, try to make one question per person. Yes. Uh, 
Well, you have to count on volition, but it's not, the question is not, do you have to count on volition, but do you have to know about it? Now, you're, you're making there, though, a good point. What we call the integration of mind and body it includes a great many topics and subdivisions. Uh, it, it goes all the way through politics and aesthetics and ethics in different forms, you know, like art as uh, entertainment versus uh, being serious, or, or um, uh, money versus knowledge, or platonic love, and so on. All of those things come under mind and body. And they would have to be distributed where they come up in the course of the development of knowledge. So down here, I was saying merely this much. If you wanted to locate the basis of the idea that there is no clash, you, I said you couldn't do this as a as a child, it would never come up to you. But if as adults, that's why I put this in parentheses, you wanted to look back and say, what is the basis of the idea of harmony between mind and body? There is nothing more fundamental in answer to that than the relation of consciousness to existence. This doesn't mean you could grasp it at this stage, and I very much doubt that you could grasp it even after volition, because it, uh, a young child would not have enough corruption to even grasp such an idea as a clash between himself and reality, let alone that that's a view, you know, that uh, is debatable and that there's opposite views on that question. So he could neither repudiate nor uh, uh, consider such a question. The most he could grasp is concrete frustration. It would never enter his mind to hold a grudge against reality. To, to get to the stage of saying, not only, you know, I can't reach that thing, but I'm down on all of reality because of it, which is the mind-body dichotomy, it has, takes ages of corruption to even dream of that. So from that point of view, the grasp of the integration of mind and body is way later. The whole issue is way later. That's why I put it in parentheses. It's not a special step. It's simply, if you were arguing with Plato, and you went back and back and back all the way down, you would finally come down to saying the point where the basis of your error has to go is that you believe in the primacy of consciousness and therefore you're disappointed in reality. And I don't and therefore I'm not. And therefore this is the takeoff uh, point. Uh, yes. Well, you say, to what extent and at what point does a parent try to teach this to a child? That is a really is a different, entirely different, thankfully, question uh, from what I have said, uh, because <clears throat> you are then talking not about what the child grasps implicitly, sh simply by the fact of being in contact with reality, but when and at what point and in what form you should try to conceptualize for the child. And that is an issue of, of pedagogy and child raising, uh, on which I have only got the sketchiest uh, general uh, views. I would certainly caution you not to try, no matter how simplified your language, to give him the substance of this morning's lecture at two. <laughs> you know, I would never try to, you know, point and say, See, the cereal is, it's something, you, it's this, and then take it away. Here it is again, I did. I would never dream of trying, to, of trying to do that. He has to wait. Philosophy, in any serious way, has to wait basically for the mid or late teens before the child can, can really do anything with it. So all you can, ba I think what you basically have to do is give him the experience of a firm reality. What a parent can do is interfere with the learning process by behaving irrationally. If you give him repeated contradictions, 
since he doesn't yet distinguish the metaphysical and the man-made clearly, in his mind it becomes a contradictory reality. Therefore your consistency uh, is crucial. It's also, I think, very, very crucial. Now here my wife is the expert and I'm not, but it, uh, I mean, she knows much more about the child raising, but in teaching um, causality I think it's very crucial, assuming the context is right, that the child learn to experience certain frustration. That is, there are parents who are um, overly solicitous and they want their uh, uh, ch child, let us say, to be benevolent and happy. And they say, why should we withhold something from the child that he wants so much and it's perfectly innocent like he wants to stay up an extra hour, he wants one further box of peanuts or whatever. What, you know, the doctor says it's medically okay and so let's we can, I can't stand to hear my child cry. I've heard this argument from um, objectivists. If a child at one or six months cries for 15 or 20 minutes, won't that be such an indelible experience that thereafter he's going to have a malevolent uh, view of life? He's got this experience of being left alone, screaming with no response. You know, they give the Kafka-esque uh, scenario. <laughs> I, I flatly disagree with that. Now, I can't get into when and how long and so on, but within, if you set reasonable rules, I think it's very important that you enforce them contextually. And if the child cries within limits and within reason, that is a very healthy thing. He has got to learn that reality cannot be manipulated. And you are the prime representatives of reality. You are, so to speak, the agents of reality to your child. He has to regularly deal with reality through you. And therefore, you've got to give them the idea that there are absolute laws. Now, you know, I've hastened to say this does not mean you should be cruel or you should tell the kid, okay, you know, 12 hours without food, this is an absolute. <laughs> These laws have to be reasonable, they have to be adapted to his requirements, they have to be applied contextually. I take all that for granted. But it is important and helpful to your child. Assuming everything else is appropriate, that he learn that he can cry and cry and not get something, and that that is an actual feature of reality, because that's the only thing that will ever get him to the fact that there is an absolute reality, and therefore that he has to, to motivate him to discover and find out what you have to do to satisfy your desires. So in this way, basically, what you have to do, well, if you remember as a parent, is not teach them metaphysics. The best way I can put it is like this. You have to be the exact opposite of a Nazi. If you remember the chapter in the Ominous Parallels, if you read it, it discussed the concentration camps, where they didn't lecture to the concentration camp inmates on bad philosophy. They didn't try to teach them there, are, there is no reality, there is no causality, uh, etc. They simply created a nightmare, unintelligible world in terms of day-by-day -day living conditions and they left it to the inmates to conclude it's hopeless, there is no reality, and to break their spirit. Now you as a parent have to do the exact reverse. You have to create within the, in the realm of your volition a completely stable, intelligible, rational, comprehensible, consistent world, and then the child will be utterly eager to travel this chain He'll grasp it all, he won't have any conflicts, and by the time he's a teenager, he can read some pamphlet that I or somebody else toss off, and he won't have any uh, problems with it at all. Now, I'm trying to get one per question, person, and it seems to me I have the same people all the time. Yes? Well, you're saying, how did Helen Keller go through this? I didn't know her personally, but she had, she uh, was blind and deaf, right? So you want to know what would you do? You'd, this is the whole point about philosophy. This applies to any consciousness under one condition. They have to have more than a single, is everything okay? They have to have more than a one sense modality. If if a person had only, for instance, the ability to experience hot and cold, or only the ability to experience rough and smooth, and that was it, then I don't think they would ever advance beyond the insect 
level, that is the level of sensation. To get on the chain at all, you have to be able to grasp entity. And to be able to grasp entity, that means the ability to put together many percepts, many different sensations into a perception, into a thing. If you only had a single sensory modality, you could never grasp thing. You'd just be grasping fleeting sensation. There'd be no way to integrate, nothing to integrate. And so you'd be stopped altogether. But Helen Keller obviously had a tremendous number of senses. She had, she, you know, she was missing some urgent ones, but she had touch with the many different distinctions that that gives you, and taste and smell, and she had proprioceptors and internal sensations and all kinds of things. So she had enough to be able to grasp entity. Touch is particularly vital in regard to entity because it gives you the idea of a solid thing. You can feel outlines, you see, you can feel texture, you can feel pressure or solidity, you can feel smoother, rough, or hot or cold. You get a tremendous amount uh, from touch. Uh, so it functions like about three or four different. Uh, but once she has enough um, sensory data to reach the stage of entity, the rest uh, does not require. Uh, she is able to grasp recurrent things simply on a tactile or whatever other basis. She's able to grasp regular sequences uh, also by whatever means she's able to grasp uh, the entities. All the rest of the sequence follows. What, if you have enough, uh, uh, of course, as adults, uh, rather as, as people without impaired senses, it's much easier for them. It's also much easier to go on to the conceptual level because if you read that play by what's his name Gibson, isn't that his name? Yeah. It's uh, it was tremendously difficult to get her to connect the word to the thing because she couldn't see or hear, and therefore she, they uh, it was uh, an enormous achievement. But that wouldn't alter her ability to travel the series. Yes, Mr. Dunn. <clears throat> Would the cultural conditions affect the order or the timing of this learning experience? No, implicitly, yes, explicitly. That is, <clears throat> an a consciousness left alone and just nourished enough to go on, these things take place in the early months. So assuming that you don't uh, inject an utterly monstrous uh, world uh, into the child. You don't bring him up in the equivalent of a concentration camp. He's going to go through, if he's brought up normally, he's going to go through certainly up to there without any interruption. Assuming, as I said, you don't freeze him with such horror that he simply stops altogether. I don't think you can speed this sequence up on this level because it takes place prior to communication. It's his direct tie with reality. So no mother, however brilliant, standing over him and saying, focus on this now, we'll speed up the entity stage. You, you can't, <laughs> this, is a, this is a matter of development. What does happen though is that a child that gets this then grows up and gets bombarded on all sides with there are no absolutes, you know, uh, Things can be whatever society wants them to be. How do you know what the sun will rise tomorrow, etc.? Then, of course, you, you put on top of this initial development, which enables them to function at all, the direct opposite. Then you turn out neurotics, and then, of course, you slow everything down. Yes? I'm wondering if the uh, child raised in a uh, primitive or savage community would have essentially the same experience in this respect. Yes, I think, uh, I think, yes. I would say myself that implicitly, implicitly, but I have to stress that, even a savage grasps, I would say, at least most of this chain. But we're talking on the level of up to a year or 18 months, and assuming he hasn't been so stunted, you know, by who knows what kind of terrifying noises and beetles and mass and initiation ceremonies and so on that he just quits. But there is no volition involved in this and no conceptualization involved in this on the implicit level. And consequently, when he opens his eyes, 
if he gets to the perceptual level, he sees things, he recognizes recurring things, even savages go through certain rites where they know they have to enact certain causes to achieve certain effects. Now, the first point at which you could say it becomes very shaky, even on the implicit level, would be the primacy of existence. Because obviously savages do, that's, that's definitional to, to being a savage, is the idea of praying and begging for, uh, uh, you know, something rather than trying to, rather than grasping clearly an external independent reality. So you could say he, in a savage society he might go off the rails there, but I would say on the implicit level we're talking about, on the implicit level, he's still able to recognize that the thing that he drops is going to drop whether he likes it or not. Now he may then be taught later, well if you pray to God, you know, X, and you bleed enough people and so on, it won't happen, and maybe he'll believe that. But there is some part of him that recognizes the primacy of existence, otherwise he couldn't function at all. So in this way I would say implicitly, with the understanding that there are tremendous adult contradictions that help to negate the effect of this, but implicitly this sequence is not open as a child to corruption by adults, unless you stop them altogether. But then of course if you don't enforce it by an explicit teaching, he won't uh, retain it and he'll fall for religion or who knows what. Yes. Way over there. Yes. Oh, Harry, is that you? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't see that. Yeah. Oh, is that right? Oh, I didn't know that. Did, did you hear that? Well, she had a tremendous advantage then. She was, he said, Helen. <laughs> no, I mean, that sounds callous, but it is true that a, if she had a year and a half of seeing and hearing, and he says she even began to speak uh, at the beginning before the uh, affliction struck that uh, caused her to go blind and deaf, then, of course, she had gone through the substance of this sequence, so there was no problem. But anyway, it was an interesting question. Though. You see, it does help to know facts, even if you're a philosopher. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, you Genevieve, yes. Well, that's a good uh, point. If I were going to be philosophically technical, I should say idealism and materialism, because idealism is the technical term, really, for the primacy of consciousness. The reason that I said uh, religion is only because that is the popular version of what philosophers call idealism. And it is also the motive of idealism. If you take any one of these idealists, whether it is Plato or uh, Kant or Hegel or whichever you take of the technical professional idealist philosophers, their heart is after God, what is named by religion. The rest is, you know, their formal philosophic defense of it. But really, uh, I was thinking in terms of uh, the the form of the theory that is widespread and uh, a broad popular appeal. If you say to most people, the essence of reality is a non-material being, uh, uh, of which matter is simply a manifestation, that will leave them cold. Say, well, it's some kind of talk. But if you say, there is a God who is all-powerful who created the world, they say, of course that's common sense. Now, <laughs> That is the same theory, but it like it's Plato's ver versus the Reader's Digest wording, you see. So it's from that, it's only that, for that reason. I believe that our time is up, so I will see you on Thursday. Thank you very much.